Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Wasif Sayyid. Dr. Wasif is the founder and CEO of IV Strategy Advisor, an educational and leadership strategy consulting firm in Washington, D.C. Dr. Microphone working? Yes? Coming? Okay, I mean, if it's the break, they can, people can come in from the break, right? Um, okay, perfect. I think this is too loud. All right, okay. So I wanted to thank the, the organizers for inviting me. We're gonna have a, a conversation about uh, cultivating an entrepreneurial Middle East. Um, I'm based in Washington. We, we run an educational leadership development firm where we work with students and young professionals to develop their personal professional capacity. And then we also do a lot of programs that are data-driven for universities, schools, companies, and, and, and governments. About a third of the work is in the Middle East, so I spend a lot of time in the Gulf. Um, just a show of hands, how many students are here? Undergrad or grad? And how many alumni are here? The rest are working professionals, yes? Okay, perfect. Is anybody here based in the Middle East? Okay, so we have a few, okay, good, excellent. All right, so um, I'm gonna start by talking a little bit about the um, idea of, of entrepreneurship in the current landscape in the Middle East. So there's a few things that we wanna focus on. First, this idea of a, a entrepreneur versus an entrepreneur. How many of you heard of the term entrepreneur? Did anybody watch Shark Tank? Yeah. Yeah. Yes? So we work with contestants from the, from the show and Mark Cuban often uses this term a entrepreneur. As somebody who gets into the idea of entrepreneurship from a fashion standpoint, rather than somebody who's a legitimate entrepreneur. So a lot of times what you'll have is you'll have people that get into this field by virtue of believing that it's more of a fad as opposed to something that they legitimately want to do. Structured versus unstructured. There are two different types of people in general when it comes to the idea of entrepreneurship. You have individuals that can function very well in a nine to five environment, report to a boss, meet deliverables. A person that functions well in an unstructured environment is somebody that can't function when you have a boss with direct supervision. They like the idea of having creative autonomy. And so just knowing and understanding that to begin with is essential before we start the conversation of becoming an entrepreneur. Being entrepreneurial vis-a-vis -vis becoming an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurial implies the idea that you want to think outside the box because in effect there is no box. As opposed to an entrepreneur, being an entrepreneur requires you to be entrepreneurial, but there are more requisites to that than just being entrepreneurial. So those are some of the things, and, and, and when we're talking about sort of the Middle East or the Gulf region, one of the biggest setbacks that we find in, 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 in the development of nascent entrepreneurship is this idea that failure is taboo. So if you look at a lot of the, 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 the big innovations like the Kareems of this world, and, and it's, it's imitation is the greatest form of flattery, right? Starting something new, you know, based on artificial intelligence that, you know, Jocelyn's group is doing, or something new that is completely different, that has a learning curve associated, is not easy to do because in general, people don't see this idea that there's as much success in success as there's success in failure. So that sets kind of the precedent of, of the current landscape, right? And, and then the question comes up is, is how do we address this, which we're gonna talk about a little bit today. But before we do that, I wanna talk a little bit about this idea of passion. So I often, in a lot of the speaking engagements we do at different schools and universities, people ask this question about, you know, Starting a business, you need to be passionate. Yes, of course, it's definitely a requisite. But passion doesn't pay the bills. Right? For an entrepreneur to be successful, there are two fundamental requirements. Number one, you have to have a user base. Number two, you have to have a revenue stream. Right? You could be selling garbage, but if you're doing a good job, you're an effective entrepreneur. Right? It's all about the sales pitch right? and the art of selling. So with that in mind, the question that comes up is what are you selling? And this is something that we often struggle with, especially in the Middle East, which is this idea. If I give you a Ferrari and I say, here's a Ferrari, you say, oh, thank you very much. It's a very nice gift to us. If I say, oh, I forgot to mention, it has an engine of a Toyota Corolla. It's not a Ferrari. People tend to focus on extrinsic as opposed to intrinsic, right? So what we're gonna talk about today, or a lot of the conversation today is gonna be focused on the idea of how do you develop your intrinsic value proposition in order to become an effective entrepreneur. And that is what is essentially required or needed 
in an entrepreneurial Middle East. Okay, so these are some of the fundamental elements that are needed in becoming an entrepreneur, right? You've got to be innovative, strategic thinker. You've got to embrace failure. You've got to empower yourself, right? And these are all snazzy words, which is great. But what we're going to focus a little bit of our conversation today is what are the fundamental building blocks that an individual needs in order to truly cultivate a truly entrepreneurial Middle East? Everybody with me? Yes? Yes. Okay, perfect. So, Google. What makes Google innovative? Somebody tell me. Not a trick question. What's, what's, why is Google considered an innovative company? Anyone? The service that everyone needs. Okay, it means the service that everyone needs. What else? It's basically a startup within a corporation is constantly innovating. Great. How is it innovating? What, 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 what does Google have that sets it apart? Young people. Young people. So, so Google maketh innovative products, but ultimately people maketh the products, right? To use old English. So the people and the investment in people is in essence what makes Google Google. So in order to create and cultivate an innovative product, you first have to focus on self-development. You have to understand how you as an individual are going to develop yourself. You can't be expected to create the next Facebook and Google unless you fundamentally understand what self-development is. So what we say in our vernacular is that self-development and product development are two sides of the same coin. Because ultimately, you are trying to entice who? The consumer. Who's the consumer? The investor, a company, a university. The general consumer that is buying your product or service. At the end of the day, we're trying to sell something because we want people to invest in some capacity in us. So. In order to start this conversation, one of the first things we do is this idea of knowing thyself. That means you have to understand why, from a business standpoint, the consumer, if we're talking about a consumer who's gonna be purchasing your product, service, now they're as interested in the why as the how. They wanna know what is your story and why are you selling what you're selling? What is the narrative? By the same token, in order to know that, you have to know these four things. We start with your story. Right? So you have to understand, on a personal level and a professional level, what makes you tick, fundamentally. Second, what is your role? What can you do? What positive contribution are you going to have in your ecosystem? Third, your impact. Not what I want to do in the future. As Jerry Maguire in the movie says, show me the money. The proof of concept, the proof in the pudding is, historically, what have you done? And that can then be the foundation to extrapolate on what can be done in the future. You have to have an established track record. Third, your environment. Where do you belong? Are we talking about a product or a service, or you functioning as a person that sets in well in a particular industry, particular demographic? A self-assessment in order for an under individual to really truly comprehend where they're going to go in life. OK, so what we're really talking about is the art of storytelling. right? Everybody has a movie. We're trying to cultivate or create an Oscar-worthy movie. But even if we don't win the Oscar, we get a screening to success. Why? Because we have the attention of the audience. And who's the audience? The consumer, an investor, an actual consumer buying your product or service, a company, a school, university. It's irrelevant. OK. So in order for, and I apologize for some of the slides being skewed. This is uploaded to a Windows machine, and I think that's part of the reason. But there are four domains of operability. A human being is not just an intellectual creature. Yes, we have a mind that's inherently connected to our value proposition. But we're physical, emotional, mental, intellectual creatures. We go to the gym to work out because we want to feel good mentally, physically, spiritually. So understanding the idea of developing yourself eventually as an entrepreneur or just as an individual on its own incorporates the many different domains of operability. We are multidimensional creatures. Sitting at a cubicle, nine to five, nine to nine, is the most inhuman thing you can do. We are human beings that are designed to interact with our ecosystem and environment. That is, that connective tissue is the very enterprise we call humanity. That's how you develop yourself. So, I'm gonna briefly show you a video. So there's an organization based in New York. How many of you heard of the Tribeca Film Festival? Okay, so I'll be going there in a, in a couple of weeks. So the, the three co-founders, of the Tribeca Film Festival, Craig Hatkoff, 
uh, Robert De Niro, the actor, of course, and, and, and Jane Rosenthal, the producer. Um, so I know Craig quite well. It's a long story. But Craig joined hands with a professor here in Boston at Harvard Business School called Clayton Christensen, who wrote the famous book, The Innovator's Dilemma. If you haven't read it, has anybody read the book, The Innovator's Dilemma? No, yes? Yeah. Good book, right? Disruptive innovation is, is a theory that he, he you know, created. But anyway, so, so they started an organization called the Disruptor Foundation, which selects individuals around the world that are disrupting traditional thinking in different ecosystems. And I became a fellow a few years ago. Every year during the film festival, they do a, a ceremony called the Tribeca Disruptive Innovation Awards, which is happening in a couple of weeks. And it's a very nice ceremony, and people come, and we actually do a summer program with them as well. But there's a lot of different fellows from different walks of life. And I want to share with you a story of one of them to highlight the point I'm trying to make. So we're going to watch a brief video. Hopefully this works. We'll come back to it. Okay. So. All right. What do we think of the video? Somebody tell me. Inspiring. Inspiring. Why is it inspiring? It's unusual. It's unusual. Why is it unusual? Beyond the stream. Exactly. And what does that tell us? Nothing is impossible. If you start the conversation with this idea that, you know what? I'm at a disadvantage. I can do something. He spent his entire life being told, no, Aaron. You can't do this. No, you can't do this because you can't walk. Did he invent the wheelchair? He didn't. Did he invent the field of extreme sports? He didn't. He combined both things together to create the profession, be entrepreneurial, because he believes in the fundamental mantra, which is that the sky is the limit, that even the limit doesn't exist because, in effect, there is no limit. So when you're starting this conversation about trying to be entrepreneurial, fundamentally what you have to do is you have to understand that if you turn every disadvantage into opportunity, then you're in the right direction. OK, how many of you know Occam's Razor? Can you tell us what that is? It can serve the idea that you can remove any unnecessary paths to get, or any unnecessary things to get from point A. Exactly. Another way of saying it, it would be? Sure. Yeah, or in colloquial terms, the simplest answer is the best answer, right? The simplest solution for any problem is the best solution. So William Oakham uh, is a 13th century English philosopher and theologian who hypothesized this in the 13th century. It was a profound statement, right? Now, how it applies to us is if we assume that A is today, B is in the future, and this is time going forward. Most of us have a bumpy ride. So we go up and down. We have good days and bad days. Some of us have more of a smooth trajectory with the bottom line. But there are those, the far few in between, who have the fundamental, innate capacity to be on their A-game 24-7. So that begs the question, how is it possible that these individuals have this capacity, this ability to be productive emotionally, personally, professionally, academically, intellectually, day in, day out? That is the question we are going to attempt to answer by addressing some areas or some traits or some processes that exist to get us towards this middle curve or middle line. Everybody with me, yes? yes. OK, so I'm a physicist. Um, it's a long story. Did my PhD at Cornell Applied Physics. So I always have one scientific slide in every talk I give to validate my physics background. 
This is it. Does anybody know what this is? Any scientists in the room? No? Yes? Dr. Saleh, can you tell us what this is? <laughs> Going too, too back in time, too much time. <laughs> it's close enough. This is the potential well of an electron. Everybody knows what an electron is, yes? Yeah. So it basically says that a potential electron is stuck in a potential well. In order to escape it, it needs at least this much energy right here. OK, why am I showing you electrons in, in potential wells? Imagine if we were an electron. Imagine if an entrepreneur in the Middle East is sitting, or an aspiring entrepreneur, and society tells them or her, there's an upper limit to what you can achieve. Great. Why do we believe that? If an electron has the fundamental innate capacity to escape a potential well, surely there's a process, an algorithm, an ability for us to unlock our potential and go from what we call a bound state to a free state. Everybody with me? So in order to achieve this process, one of the fundamental things that we have to understand is our identity, our motivation. If we're trying to be an entrepreneur. We're trying to sell something. We're trying to cultivate an entrepreneurial Middle East. We have to understand our identity. Our identity is a multivariable problem. It's a function of your likes or dislikes, where you travel, where you haven't traveled what your aspirations are, what your dreams are. That entire ecosystem of different variables together form your narrative. But who you are today is very, very different than who you are trying to be in the future. Because if it was the same, there would be no personal professional growth. So I want everybody to kind of understand and self-reflect on who they are today as an individual and where they're trying to be. Because that, in essence, is what developing an individual and developing yourself entails. Okay. We go to Wall Street and we say, hey, what is, what is Wall Street interested in? Money. Money. There's no free lunch. So you go to Wall Street and you say, I have a brilliant idea. Invest in me. Invest in my idea. OK. The Wall Street is looking at you as a portfolio of assets and saying, OK, I want to see what this individual has that are good apples and bad apples. If you're a student, part of it is going to be looking at your academic record, your work experience in the summers, et cetera, et cetera. If you're an entrepreneur, your track record, what the product is or the services. There are many different dimensions. But ultimately, in our portfolio of assets, however you quantify them, they're good apples and bad apples. So you have to establish in no uncertain terms to that investor, to that consumer, what is my rate of return? How am I going to give you your money back, number one. Number two, what is my insurance policy? What have I done or will do to address the shortcomings in my portfolio? This process, to be brief, of optimizing strategic portfolio is inherently connected to your value proposition. And it fundamentally addresses the question of what added value are you going to add in whatever ecosystem you're going to be part of as an entrepreneur not based on what you will do, but what do you have done. There has to be historical evidence. We're not here to hold hands and sing kumbaya. We can if we want to. I probably don't know the word, but it's a competition, plain and simple. So this is this idea that we use a lot with clients, which is this idea of disruptive transformation. So if I take adults and I define the term adult loosely and airdrop them into the middle of the jungle in Botswana, chances are they're going to freak the heck out. If I take a young person and I define the term young loosely, and put them in a similar environment. Yes, there's an element of fear. But by and large, young people have an overarching propensity that, you know what, I am Superman or Wonder Woman. I can take on the world. They like taking risk. And you have to use it in a positive way. How? How many of you know Michael Phelps? Michael Phelps started swimming when? How old was he? Any ideas, guesses? Close. Seven. <laughs> Add a few years. He won his first national championship when he was 10. Now, I'm not saying we reverse the clock and go back in time. Talent development is a multi-dimensional process. Fundamentally, you have to invest resources and time to develop a skill, to develop a product, to develop yourself. Second, you have to disrupt yourself because you're going to get tunnel vision. Society likes labels. Oh, he's a physicist. He's an economist. Oh, she's an anthropologist. Because it's convenient. I'm not saying that you want shouldn't specialize. I'm saying there's more to a human being than what you work or what you study. We spend a third of our life sleeping, a third working, and a third is other. Sleep, OK, more is good, fine. But work, you want to do something that you enjoy, ideally. 
Because ultimately, the million dollar question we are trying to address is happiness, which you can't quantify. I often ask anecdotally, are you happy, excited, or content? Majority of people are borderline content. So the idea of us trying to gravitate to a better state involves you making sure that on a habitual, constant basis, you might wake up one morning, hate your job or hate your business idea you want to change. What are your transferable skills? What are you going to do that can allow you to go to a different area? So you have to continuously improve your strengths, address your weaknesses, broaden your scope, read different things, different books, expose yourself to different ideas, almost like an algorithmic process. Because that is what's going to get you to where you need to be. In order to do that, there's something very critical that we need. What's the first thing you do when you go to a new city? Buy a map. What did you say? Buy a map. Exactly. Every, you need a map. Spot on. Every single day of your life is a new city. My question to you is, where's your map? I'm not asking you a hypothetical thought experiment. I'm asking you point blank the question of show me your map. I find it confounding that most people don't have, these are my three, six, nine, 12 month deliverable. Now, I don't care if you put, I want to go to the moon and back. Fine. But you better be prepared to do the work it takes to become an astronaut. OK. So part of becoming entrepreneurial is to demonstrate leadership, not just in your discipline, but for yourself, to the world. And leadership is not this idea that you're a CEO of a Fortune 500 company. You might be a complete idiot. Surround yourself with smart people. Leadership is the idea that you fundamentally have the innate capacity to empower your peers to uplift their potential. Because if you can do that, I can airdrop you in any ecosystem in the world. And you're going to replicate that. Not because you say so, but because you have done so. That's the difference. Proof of concept. Now, there are different things that you need to become a leader. We're not going to get into too much detail, but one of the fundamental ways that innovative companies have changed, and innovative schools by extension, such as MIT, is peer-to-peer -peer learning, knowledge transfer. Historically, it was monotone, monodirectional. You learn from your professor, and that's it. Now, you learn as much from each other as you do from your professor's boss's supervisor's manager, or IB should. So when you're talking to a manager, you're going to feel they're important. That doesn't mean they're a leader. When you're talking to a leader, you're going to feel you're important, role reversal. That is a fundamental difference. And I challenge every one of you who are working or, or, or in university to always kind of synthesize this when you're communicating with somebody that's in the role of you know, senior responsibility. OK, there's one other thing we need in order for us to embark on this journey of self-development. What do these athletes have in common? Somebody tell me. They help their opponents. Their, their, their opponents. OK, what else? OK, how did they do that? Huh? Goal. They have a goal, OK. And who helped them achieve their goal? Coaches. Thank you, coaches. Thank you, Jocelyn. They all have a good coach. So we're going to watch a quick video, and we'll come back to this. Everyone needs a coach. It doesn't matter whether you're a basketball player, a tennis player, a gymnast, or a bridge player. <laughs> My bridge coach, Sharon Osberg, says there are more pictures of the back of her head than anyone else's in the world. <laughs> Sorry, Sharon. There you go. We all need people who will give us feedback. That's how we improve. Over the years, I've received so many different kinds of advice, I don't know where to start. One that comes to mind is to have a coach. Our board member in 2002, John Doerr, said, you need a coach. And I said, well, I don't need a coach. I'm an established CEO. Why would I need a coach? Is something wrong? He said, no, 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 you need a coach. Everybody needs a coach. So Bill Campbell became my coach and has served Google very well. Every famous athlete, every famous performer, has somebody who's a coach, somebody who can watch what they're doing and say, is that what you really meant? Did you really do that? They can give them perspective. The one thing people are never good at is seeing themselves as others see them. A coach really, really helps. OK. My question to you is very simple. I'm not talking about your professors, your parents, your friends, 
I'm asking the specific question of who is your coach. If there's one key lesson you take away from today's conversation is this idea that the number one inhibitor to an individual not being able to reach the utmost of their potential is a lack of mentorship. Not just for a specific career objective, educational objective, for life. Okay, so entrepreneurship or the idea of being entrepreneurial is a pillar under strategic leadership, right? That has two other legs, teamwork and civic engagement. And in order to become a strategic leader, you have to become an innovative leader first. So in the 10, 20 minutes we have left, I'm gonna first talk about innovative leadership. Let me see if you missed the slide, yeah. And then we're gonna go through one case study probably in time and we'll break off to questions afterwards. In order to become an innovative leader, which is a process we have yet to define, there are three fundamental things that a person has to do. Whether you're talking about developing yourself with the ultimate objective of starting a business, or you already have a business, or you're talking about developing yourself for the next stage of your career, it's irrelevant. You have to be on this track of innovative capacity development. One, you have a fundamental process that allows you to organically evolve with time. You're constantly discovering new things about yourself, which can only happen if you disrupt yourself on a continual basis, regularly. Second, you have a sense of ownership. The story that you have, your narrative, resonates with the consumer. Who's the consumer? An investor, a company, a school. Irrelevant, the world around you. Third, you have an ability to positively con contribute to your ecosystem by uplifting the potential of those around you. You play a role, a viable role, in peer-to-peer -peer learning. That's the trifecta, why? Because ultimately the consumer is asking the question, how will you contribute to the community? That's what an investor is asking. When you bring a product to the table, that's what they're asking. That's the million dollar question. You've gotta answer it in no uncertain terms. So, every individual has three things. Social equity, liquid equity, intellectual capacity. Intellectual capacity is this, your brain power. It took time, family upbringing, moral values, intellectual values. That's what you're selling to the consumer. Social equity is access to human capital. You're at MIT, or some of you are, or at universities elsewhere, or you're working. You have access, we're not hermits, we have access to people. Liquid equity are resources, monetary and logistical. This conference is a resource that the MIT students put together by leveraging the fact that MIT is a platform. So the key to the algorithm that we use, both at the individual and institutional level, to develop human capital is this. You take these three things, you create what we call an innovative platform. The innovative platform is your business card. Oh, this is the product or service I'm interested in. This is what I'm selling. Why? Because of X, Y, and Z. This is who I am as a person, not because I say so, but because I have done so. I have had impact in X, Y, Z area. And what that, how that manifests at an individual level is twofold. One, personal development, which we'll talk about in a second, and social impact, which is one of the most misunderstood concepts out there. And we'll talk about that in a second, too. Growth and development. In general, if a person hates something, they're not going to do it. So if I hate fishing, I'm not going to go fishing every weekend. In general. So let's say a person really, really likes tennis. Okay. That's an interest. As you improve, you're leveraging the strength to take it to the next level, which is you're gonna start getting a coach. You start investing time and resources. Maybe you start competing in competitions. And that gets you to the third rung of the staircase. At that point, you go to the world and you say, I am a leader in this field because I have proven through competitions, experience, yada, 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 the ability to demonstrate some fundamental expertise in this area. So this process is iterative. You go through an evolution of personal, professional, academic, intellectual, emotional interest through college, grad school, and when you're working. But the key is you've got to actively cultivate them through this kind of paradigm. It's not going to happen sitting on your own. Social impact. I have an iPhone. Many of you have iPhone smartphones. Apple revolutionized the notion of communication on a global ecosystem. They changed the way we communicate. They made a lot of money on that process. But Social impact is as much about the for-profit as it is about the non-profit. So, when you wake up in the morning, this is the trifecta of becoming an innovative leader, whether that leads to an entrepreneurial path, that's fine. But self-development is the first step in this equation. You have to have innovative leadership, you have to have mentorship, and you have to have growth and development. That's our trifecta. Without it, 
There's no development taking place. You're just relying on the system and going with the flow as you work. I don't know how many soccer fans here. I'm a Liverpool fan. I'm very excited for Liverpool to go to the final. I'm hoping I can go. Yes? When you start the Champions League season, you don't say, oh, I'm going to win the final. You go match by match. The problem is, we're not going by match by match. We're just going with the flow. We wake up, do our thing, and this, and we get caught up, we're busy, this, no. You invest in yourself in order to reap the benefits of that investment. Okay, I'm gonna go through maybe one or two case studies and then we'll conclude. This is an example I always start with young students. We work with a broad age range, 10, 35, 36, 37. We've had older too, but I always start with young students. This was a young student from Ohio who was very interested in music and community engagement. And this particular case, long story short, this is a three year narrative that I'm gonna synthesize for you to show you what the process and how it looks like on paper. That student, spent a lot of time in Africa doing community work on the ground with an American NGO. That accumulation of experiences eventually led to this book that was published when she was 16. It's available on Amazon. Then, after that, what ended up happening was to combine her music passion with community engagement, we said, let's start a company called Bands for Change, which is an escort in Ohio. And the idea was to host concerts with A-list musicians. Now, I don't have any background in the music industry, but I know how a process works. Cutting a long story short, it took us one year of reaching out to booking agents, musicians, et cetera, et cetera, and, and nobody would entertain even the thought of organizing a concert because in the US, Live Nation has a monopoly and it's very expensive and not easy to do. But after one year of blood, sweat, and tears, what happened? How many of you know who that is? Yes? I forgot her name. Kesha. I don't know if you know Kesha. So Kesha came back to us, loved the idea. Last January, we hosted a concert with Kesha. 1,500 people came. Needless to say, the student was, became the most popular kid in school overnight and was all over the news, NBC, CBS, ABC. What's my point? My point is there aren't high school kids going around organizing concerts with Kesha, but this one is. That's what I mean by the sky is the limit and even the limit doesn't exist because in effect, there is no limit. We don't set a barrier to what one can achieve. Yeah, you need a process, you need an algorithm, you need, a, you need a execution plan, but anything, literally anything is possible. Okay, and I think, you know, we're basically out of time, but I wanna thank the committee. I'm happy to entertain some questions in the last couple of minutes we have. But appreciate the attention, appreciate you know, your engagement. I hope that was insightful. Okay. Yeah. yeah no, it's working. Thank you, Dr. Wasso, for the great presentation. You know, I've uh, I've known you for many years, so this is not really a question, but I think uh, it's worthwhile to highlight some of your achievements in how you coach um, high school students and make them really get into the best of the best schools. You know, I've uh, I had also a personal experience. Um, a, a mutual friend of ours who um, who wanted to go to a, a great school. Uh, the coaching that you did really um, shows that uh, the sky is the limit. Um, I think you know it would be worthwhile maybe to uh, to talk a little about a little bit about this since you have been doing this for a, for a long time. Um, uh, it would really be great for everyone to know about this. This is perhaps uh, I would say um, the most. Uh, interesting and the most rewarding um, uh, effort that uh, one can do to help people in their future educational, uh, you know, um, advancements. Thank you. So I'll, I'll briefly talk about that. Thank you for the question, Jasim. So uh, the process of, of, of coaching or developing somebody, um, the best analogy is that they're the actor actress, we're the director, and we're writing a screenplay together. And we want to produce the screenplay and produce the movie and hope it wins an award at the Cannes Film Festival. So the way we do it, of course, is the first step is to understand the individual's background, do an assessment, and then we create a long-term strategic plan, whether the student is in high school, in college, or working professional, regardless of age, to figure out what's the trajectory to build the connective tissue around the individual so that we can create a brand that both has extrinsic and intrinsic value. And that will then help entice the consumer. The consumer is a college, a grad school, an investor, a company, regardless of who it is. 
So the process is iterative in the sense that some things work, some things don't work. And you regularly engage with them on a habitual time period to really understand what their story is and how can we take the story to the next level. We'll take one last question before going to the break. All right. Thank you, Dr. Wasif, for showing Cristiano Ronaldo instead of Messi in your slides, being a Real Madrid fan. I just want to also um, want to clarify how does talent fit in your framework? Where does it appear? If it's only coaching, then what should coach work on? If it, having an efficient coach would work with everyone, or there's a specific one who sure. stand up and have a talent, sure. and then the coach would work on that and make him fit more into the... It's a very important question. So, so in talent development, so we're in the field of talent incubation, identification, and development. Now, there's two issues. One is, when you're talking about human capital development, what I have found in this space is the majority of entities or individuals do not have or possess the execution experience. They'll talk about coaching somebody because you use them as a sounding board, but they don't have the experience to put together the kind of platforms I'm talking about. And I'm not just talking about concerts, it could be anything. It could be creating a nonprofit, it could be starting a business. So the way that we do it is not just by A, oh, this is what you should do, it's how can we put together a game plan to actually execute. That's the first thing. Now, there are functional limitations. We have a lot of individuals, depending on the year, whether they're in high school, college, or young professionals, that have specific talents, music, sport. Those specific functional talents are not talents that we developed or develop. We either identify them, or we then find a coach that specializes in that specific sport, or music, let's say, right? So, so the coaching is about developing the holistic enterprise of the individual, and along the way, when you discover specific functional skills, you will need additional functional coaches. We're not providing the functional coaching for making them a better soccer athlete as much as they love soccer. What we're doing is we're creating the connective tissue to assign a game plan. The best analogy, I, I guess, would be, um, you know, if you using sport as an example, you have a coach that's coaching Messi and Ronaldo, arguably two of the best players in the world. Maybe Mohamed Salah can be included down in that. But they're not the ones scoring the goals, right? So, so I want us to separate this idea of functional coaches, which are necessary, and we're not trying to duplicate that effort, from just having somebody like Eric Schmidt was saying, a coach. Why, he said, why do I need a coach when he went to John, when John Doerr? Because everybody needs a coach. But you have to get somebody who really understands and data. Now, in our case, because I'm a physicist, at this time, we probably have worked with, well, not probably, we have, hundreds of individual case studies, a third of which at least are from the Middle East. So, when I say case studies, I'm not talking about you sit with somebody and talk to them once, I'm talking about over years. The youngest student we have right now is 10 years old from Saudi Arabia. That's a long time to work with somebody, from 10 to 18, 10 to 19, I mean, that's a lifetime. That tacit knowledge is invaluable. So when we talk about human capital development, it's a very specific, filtered uh, way of doing it, which involves a learning curve, because you have to educate the audience, because they think, oh, this is just like executive coaching, and no, it isn't. That's a sounding board which is valuable, but we're talking about also the execution of the individual, if that makes sense. Thank you for your questions, thank you for your time, thank you to the organizers. Um, look forward to seeing you at the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Now we'll go for the coffee break and the speed mentorship.